green plant or whatever. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rich Medeiros, and I'm working today with Brett Zerba, and we are going to be putting together this HVAC Pump Basics webinar. So I just wanted to say hello to all the folks out there. Um, please accept our apologies for the technical difficulties that we had last week. Uh, it's kind of the good news and bad news. We had over 1,800 people sign up, and uh, we didn't realize because the numbers came in in the last, uh, literally in the last uh, half a day or so. And so the, uh, but we've changed over to uh, a higher volume platform and we can accept up to 5,000 um, attendees. So, so we're gonna go through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, the first thing we'd like you to do is just raise your hand. You can press the little hand button that way. We know that you can see the screen, which should have the green Taco green leaves on it and should say HVAC Pump Basics on it. So if a few of you guys could click on your hand waving screen, I see a few green screens, green hand wavings. That's great. That looks good. Excellent. All right. So with that, take care of that. Uh, the other thing I want you to recognize is that uh, if you have some questions, I will be monitoring the questions while Brett does the presentation. So uh, periodically I will stop Brett and we'll pick out uh, a question or two. So if someone also wants to test, anybody that just wants to type in under the question things, just hello, Rich, and that way I'll know the question system is working. That's great. Looks like we've got a couple of folks typing in. Excellent. Okay, that that's working good. I also want to point out that uh, you should have in your screen a button that says handouts. We have three handouts uh, that go along with this presentation. One of them is uh, the pump INO manual for the FIFE pumps. Another one is the KS pump INO manual and the startup pump startup checklist. Those are the three handouts that we've got going today. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, you'll be able to download a uh, certificate. You'll get an email notice. Certificate will be for the uh, PDH hours for anybody that's interested. So when the broadcast is over within the next 24 hours, look for an email from the uh, webinar system that says to uh, download your certificate. Okay. So with that in mind, I think I've covered... Uh, a few of the housekeeping items. At this point, I do want to say thank you very much for attending our series of webinars. Uh, we've had a terrific uh, turnout from all over the world, in fact. So uh, I'm sure that we'll have a nice presentation today. So Brett, I'm going to turn it over to you to say a few words and also to launch the presentation. So Brett, take it away. Thank you so much, Rich. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, hello, everybody. Brett Zorba. I'm an applications engineer with TACO. Um, I want to apologize in advance if I fade in and out. Rich will open up some questions if that ever happens. Uh, for some reason, uh, that happens every once in a while. But uh, I, I have worked for TACO for almost 24 years. I am a degreed mechanical engineer. I graduated from the University of New Hampshire up here in New England in 1981. So yes, I am an old fart. Um, but anyways, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, let's have a little fun today. Uh, so the title of this is HVAC Pump Basics or Fundamentals. So we're really gonna try to keep it, uh, it you know, to, to give you some insight into uh, our product line, not our product line, but uh, the pumps, HVAC pumps, you know, clean water pumps really that uh, help heat and cool buildings throughout the world. Um, uh, so that's uh, a, a pretty uh, pretty uh, broad topic to say the least. And one of the first things I like to mention now, uh, Rich and I work more with, uh, folks in the commercial um, uh, arena, schools and apartments and uh, office buildings and, and such. So in our terminology, we call them pumps. But some, if not, uh, there, there could be quite a few out there uh, in, in uh, audience land that these uh, little bad boys is circulators. Well, guess what? The words are almost synonymous. They do the same thing. They move water 
around buildings, pretty much clean water. And we'll get into different types of fluids um, or chemicals, I guess I, I will say a, a little further in the broadcast. But for the most part, um, uh, they move water. So a circulator and a pump um, virtually mean the same thing. Mo many, if not most of the parts are the same. The volute, the casing, s some have seals, some don't, whatever, stuff like that. Impellers, uh, the main components are, are, are the same. Um, and at, at our factory, uh, we are located in Cranston, Rhode Island. That's where head, uh, world headquarters are uh, for Takeo Comfort Solutions. Um, uh, we, uh, some of you, I, I, I did look at uh, the attendee list a little bit. Uh, I know you've been to our facility and in Bay One and, and maybe a couple of uh, other parts of uh, some of our other bays and our big manufacturing facility, that's where we assemble our little pumps, the circulators. And then in Bay Three is where we Bay Three and Four we assemble our our commercial pumps. Uh, just just to let you know that. So let's get right into HVAC pump basics and uh, ask away. We we want to try to answer your questions the best we can um, as we go here. So uh, let's get let's get rolling. So here's some basic information about a centrifugal pump. Pumps create differential pressure. Uh, in our uh, terminology, a delta P. So that's that's a main function of a pump is to create this di differential pressure. And the water flows, right? We're moving water. These 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 bad boys move water from higher pressure to lower pressure. Kind of makes sense, right? And then the delta P that these pumps induce flow against system resistance. And uh, we're going to talk about system resistance. I uh, hopefully most of you know what what we're talking about already about system resistance. Uh, someone in your facility or or, or or company may have already done some, or you've seen resistance calculations, and and we're actually going to have a webinar on that, how to actually do it. There's software out there that helps you do it. Um, so uh, uh, keep that in mind. Um, uh, so that delta P induces flow against system resistance, and that's what these pumps are installed in, some type of system. And then in an open system, and we're going to get into the, the differences between a closed and open system, the delta P also induces lift against atmospheric pressure and gravity. All right, those are the bullet points on the screen. In a closed system, they do not, uh, the pump does not need to uh, overcome the lift because it's close to the atmosphere. What goes up comes down, I guess is a good way to think about that. Rich and I talk about a lot of things uh, <clears throat> or with folks uh, sometimes. Um, that may be a little confusion to folks, so we want to make sure you understand. So low speed liquid is pushed into the impeller inlet by upstream pressure or potential energy that is greater than the pressure at the impeller inlet. And some of these terms I'm saying, impeller and, uh, and whatnot, uh, I'm going to show you some pictures of them, but that's what's happening inside the pump. The liquid is pushed into the impeller veins and you're going to see some uh, uh, cutaways of what I'm talking about with a vein and is accelerated to a higher velocity which is kinetic energy mostly radial right going out radial as it moves outward to the exit diameter of the impeller and well you know you're going to see some cutaways so hopefully some of the terminology will you, you can kind of place it together once we start looking at some of the cutaways after the liquid exits the impeller it is expanded or diffused, slowed down or whatever into the volute, and that's part of the pump, the volute, the casing, you'll see some pictures of that, of the pump and conversion of velocity in, uh, into kinetic energy, into pressure from potential energy. So, hey, Brett, uh, uh, it's yeah? Rich. Uh, have you changed your slides because um, it nope, looks not like... yet. Oh, okay, all right. I just so did. Someone made a... Uh, an... Someone said uh, it looks like the slides aren't changing. Okay, so yeah, yeah. sounds All good. Right. So I was on, yeah, uh, so I just gave you a little more definition about some of the delta P's and stuff like that. So let's talk about a little more about resistance. So in our industry, right, closed systems, homes, mo mo most homes, uh, right, uh, if it's a boiler, right, the moving water around the uh, house, uh, like like uh, I can hear my boiler running right now. Um, not open to the atmosphere. The delta P induces flow against system resistance or head, right? Delta P head. Some of that terminology is uh, is virtually the same. No lift in a closed system. And here's a picture of a very simple closed system, right? I'm showing a, a chiller. 
Oh, let me get my spotlight here. Here's a little base. It's water cooled. It's not attached to anything. Here's our pump. Some other valve, but you can see the piping going around the building, right? And then um, these are I'm representing fan coils. Very simple, right? I, I'm not disagreeing with anyone out there. Very very simple system. Here's uh, another component that you'll see, an air and dirt separator, air separator, expansion tank. But nonetheless, this is a closed loop system, like what I mentioned um, uh, before. And it no in a closed system. Open system, right? This pump has to overcome uh, the, the, the uh, open to atmosphere, like in a cooling tower. I, uh, hopefully you're familiar, if not most, most of you, if not all of you are familiar with type of a condenser water or cooling tower um, application. That's pretty common in the HVAC industry, all right? So the delta P induces flow against system resistance or the head of the system, the piping and whatnot, and lift or elevation change. And I'll show you a picture what I mean by that. So when I show you this picture here, this pump has to push water through the uh, resistance of the chiller, of these components, the valves, the piping, elbows, T's, everything right pipe itself has resistance uh, and there's all kinds of charts out there that show you how much resistance for a proper flow uh, properly sized pipe as well uh, per 100 feet and it all comes into play there but nonetheless that's that delta p that we we're talking about in an open system in an open system it, it also has to overcome so it's got this piping it's got the resistance right but it also has to come this elevation change here from from actually this suction part or the outlet of the cooling tower, this elevation change up to the top. So all of this is still um, up and down, right? But this part here is part of the lift that we talk about. And then over here on this side is a closed system. So the delta P that the pump uh, produces, um, uh, you know, your head and flow and, and whatnot has to overcome uh, the, the uh, resistance in these type of systems. So just keep that in mind. So here's a cutaway of a centrifugal pump. And actually by looking, I can tell, and hopefully some of you, if not all of you, can tell it's a base-mounted pump because I can see where my little, oh, you know, you gotta remember to keep the spotlight, but I don't think you can advance screens, Rich. It, uh, but anyways, um, here, here's the yeah, feet. It's a, it's, feet a strange, uh, it's a strange presentation tool, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's great to have, uh, but uh, it does get cumbersome at some points. Anyways, here's a cutaway of a centrifugal pump, base-mounted type. And here's some of the terminology that you will uh, start, you, you got to get familiar with or hear, right? Um, and number one is the impeller, all right? Uh, pumps have impellers, and there's different types of impellers, different material. Most common is probably bronze, but there are some stainless steel ones out there, although they're a little harder to um, uh, work with, uh, trim or whatnot, just because of the, the strength of the stainless. So mo most, I, I think, for commercial are, 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 are um, uh, bronze, uh, but uh, some of the smaller ones for circulators may be plastic, uh, some special types of plastic as well. But nonetheless, here, here here's some impellers here. Um, and this is the vein. This is an example of a vein. Okay, we talked. I talked about the. I touched upon the vein earlier, and I think this uh, uh, cutaway shows eight veins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I guess I really didn't have to count those out just to help you. But nonetheless, these are the veins here. And pump design engineers actually work very hard when they design pumps to uh, get the uh, correct amount of veins inside the impeller uh, or part of the impeller. So, so it, it, it all works together from a flow and the radial standpoint, the resistance, uh, internal resistance to the pump and uh, uh, fitting and, and all of that. So some, some impellers may only have six veins, eight veins, 10 veins or whatever, but nonetheless, they are veins. And the rotation of these, these impellers, one thing I always like to tell folks when I talk about uh, this type of presentation is the impellers don't, the veins don't scoop. So it doesn't rotate in this direction, right? You can kind of see this little half moon or quarter moon or whatever. They don't scoop water, they throw water radially, radially, whatever that word is. So it actually would scoop it out this way, rotate in this direction, all right? Here's the volute or the casing, right? This is the most applications it's a cast iron component i mean there's some other materials out there but 
probably your most common is cast iron um, uh, in that regard. Uh, this is the diffuser I was talking about, throw or throat. You'll hear different terminologies out there and the discharge. And for the most part, I think uh, for the bigger pumps or the commercial pumps, um, uh, the discharge is flanged. Um, you have some, uh, for, for circulators, they, it, you may have some different types of arrangements, but nonetheless, um, uh, for, for most, most applications commercially, for the bigger stuff, um, uh, it's a flange type of connection, as well as there would be a flange on the suction or inlet side as well. And here's the suction, right? So uh, that's a suction of, of the impeller. So that's where that lower lowest pressure is um, uh, on the pump as well. And this is the cut water. And uh, again, pump design engineers, uh, R&D folks, who are, whatever you want to call them, are, are very concerned about the, the distance between the impeller, outside edge of the impeller, and the cut water. That the tighter that clearance, uh, the, the the better the efficiency and, and the smoothness. And all of that gets has to get taken into account um, uh, in, in that regard. So this picture actually represents a maximum diameter impeller. And then it's not uncommon in our industry that impellers are trimmed all the way down to a minimum in diameter impeller. And um, for the most part, the minimum diameter is based on the um, uh, hub of the impeller. Uh, you can only get so close before there's nothing there. Uh, so it, it, when you look at curves, you, you, you can kind of get an idea and you'll see that further on in the presentation. So, so keep that in mind as we go. And again, it's very important to realize that this um, rotates in this direction. At Takeo, and, and it's, this isn't uncommon, it, you know, I, I'm going to talk about Takeo quite a bit because uh, that's the company I work for and uh, uh, and whatnot, but at Takeo, we uh, trim quite a few of our impellers, depends on the actual order um, that goes through our, 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 our production line, and we balance our impellers. Uh, we balance our impellers. We have quite the Quite a nice machine out there that does both. Well, uh, it, it it can do both, but at different times. But nonetheless, it trims and balances impellers. And um, when we talk about balancing impellers, it's a little. Uh, it, it, um, hopefully, some of you, if not most of you, are familiar with balancing tires on a car, right? When you bring it in, you get tires or whatnot, new tires. They balance it. They they they'll spin it around and actually add uh, lead. I believe it's lead. That's what I the tires that I've been involved with or, or purchased over the years. Um, uh, on it, for impellers at our facility, we take material, we spin it, and they get an idea where the heavy spot is and are taking material off. So we do uh, balance. Uh, and that, the, the actual um, numbers, uh, the uh, re requirements for the balancing is actually set forth by the Hydraulic Institute. Uh, so we uh, follow that quite a, uh, to, to a T, you know, to be quite honest. Um, we have to, right? We have to. And um, and that brings up a point. Uh, most pump manufacturers, uh, and especially Takeo for sure, uh, we follow um, the hydraulic, uh, the HI guidelines um, for, for most of our, uh, for all of our design criteria for the, for, uh, if you work with our R&D engineers, um, they, they go with the Hydraulic Institute. Uh, they actually, the Hydraulic Institute is a, uh, a formula, it, it's a group of pump manufacturers that write standards uh, from all over the, well, uh, North America, but it's it's actually, uh, there's one in uh, all over the world uh, centered in Europe as well. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. And actually, uh, Takeo um, is very proud uh, because one of our employees, Mark Chaffee, was uh, voted member of the year for 2000 and what the heck year is this? Not, this is 2020, although I'd like to forget it. But anyways, 2019, uh, a Takeo employee, Mark Chaffee, was member of the year. Uh, so he did, he volunteered a lot of work for the Hydraulic Institute. Hey, Brett. Yes, sir. We have a couple of really cool questions. Awesome. I thought this might be a good time. Uh, so I'm just going to call out first names. Yeah. So, um, so uh, one question that came up is uh, for balancing, do we do both uh, dynamic and static balancing? And I believe the answer is we only do dynamic. We only do spin balance. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. Yes. So uh, back in the day, there may have been static balancing techniques, but today it's all done by uh, spin balancing. We have one of the more sophisticated machines that uh, balances our impellers. If you ever happen to visit the factory, you should stop by and watch the machine in action. It's really amazing. Now, the other question that came up 
is, uh, let's see, uh, with a VFD on the pump motor, should you ever trim the impeller? <laughs> and actually, that's a, a two-sided question. You go first. Right? <laughs> that's a little basics, I'll say that, for uh, each uh, presentation. Um, uh, I, I, I would never say that a uh, blanket stand, standpoint that you there are situations where trimming the impeller the VFD is still advisable. Um, Rich, you want to add to that statement? Yeah, it it uh, it depends uh, on the individual pump and what the uh, design operating point is and what you're looking for for the characteristics out of the pump. So in some cases it may not make sense to trim the impeller. In other cases it does. So uh, yeah, so we do. Uh, we actually manufacture pumps. We have uh, pumps that we send out to our customers that we have not trimmed the impeller and we're getting the performance characteristics by changing the pump speed. And, we, and we're rec recommending the pump speed directly from the factory. And in other cases, we're trimming the impeller. So yeah, we do both. Another uh, question came up. It says, when you have a mechanical seal, uh, is there any type of maintenance to be done on that assembly? Well, I think I can answer that question pretty straightforward. A mechanical seal is dependent upon the quality of the water that's in the system. And so if the uh, water quality is poor and uh, it's uh, in, it's allowed to uh, have suspended materials, and, and the example I like to use, look, if you have sand in the water, and we have projects out there that are sand in there, that sand will get between the two surfaces of the seal and destroy that seal in a relatively short period of time. So the, uh, the maintenance of the seal, the seal itself does not require any specific maintenance, but the water quality does have to be maintained in order to extend the life and the integrity of the seal. Okay, Brett, okay. Uh, we did have someone say they lost the audio. So can we do another quick uh, um, wave of the hands if, if the audio is okay? I'm going to just take a quick look here at the, uh, yeah, I see a bunch of hands going up. So the audio seems to be fine. So if, uh, if someone lost the audio that's out there, uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but Looks like uh, everyone else can hear it okay. So maybe it's an individual case. It, it, that did happen to me uh, uh, in the past, um, uh, maybe not through this, but anyways on webinars and I, I would have to get out and get back in and it came back on. So who knows? So uh, here's another picture of uh, a cutaway uh, of, uh, of a pump, right? And the impeller impeller spins, accelerates the, the liquid radially. I talked about that before. So it spins in this direction and the liquid accelerates to the outer edges, liquid force to the outside of the impeller, right? You got the static energy and then kinetic energy as it moves out to the impeller. The cut water, the cut water, right? This, this close tight area here diverts the liquid out through the discharge. One of the reasons why this uh, area is very, very important is because there is in this uh, inherent to these designs, some internal recirculation. So the higher the internal recirculation, the lower the efficiency. So you wanna keep that internal recirculation as low, uh, as low as possible. That's why the engineers work hard uh, on their design work when they're, when they're trying to figure that all out. So that's another reason why um, and, and this is more on curves and whatnot, but the, this term that we uh, Rich has gone over before and we've talked about best efficiency point is at the maximum impeller cut. Once you start cutting the impeller, excuse me, trimming the impeller, right? Uh, trim, cut, whatever your terminology you want to use, you're, you're gaining some dimension here, greater dimension, so you do get some internal recirculation. So uh, just keep that in mind. And the impeller eye, that's another term that uh, you should be familiar with the eye the impeller eye that's kind of the opening uh, where the water comes in is the point of lowest pressure um, so uh, really that's kind of some of the basics again i like to re-emphasize this as much as i can just to get so you get comfortable with it and there's that discharge and, and whatnot and again just a reminder the impeller throw the water the liquid they do not suck or, or excuse me uh, 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 go in this direction they don't they don't scoop it 
they throw it. So that's uh, something from a basic standpoint that it's uh, pr pretty important to understand. All right, so uh, uh, just a couple of pictures of a, a couple of different types of centrifugal pumps. Uh, uh, different. Uh, if you go into uh, mechanical rooms, you may see one type compared to another. It's just so you'd understand some of the, the terminology. The one on the left is a centerline uh, discharge one, and the one on the right is a tangential uh, uh, discharge one, tangential to the uh, centerline, okay? One is centerline, one is tangential. They both move water uh, very, very efficiently, and, and, and they both do their jobs, right? The, I'm not trying to say one's better than the other, um, but nonetheless, uh, they both um, are, are, are out there, and you can see different ones. Um, uh, different manufacturers do them different ways. Some may even do both or whatever. Um, the Taco ones, all Taco and suction pumps are centerline discharge. Um, uh, centerline discharge weight is evenly distributed, and so it, it does allow the cell venting, meaning that the casing itself um, helps get the air out. It gets into the stream, so some other piece of equipment uh, can, can can eliminate it. The air air and air separator or whatnot. Uh, but but anyways, like I said, they're both uh, uh, they both do their job, and they both are out in the industry and in the marketplace uh, in that regard. So uh, just keep that in mind. So here's a breakdown uh, of what some of the other components are of a base mounted pump. Well, first off, how did I know it was a base mounted pump? Well, because it's on a base. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be silly there, but nonetheless, I think you can see that very, very quickly just by looking at this uh, uh, pump. And it is an end suction pump, meaning that the suction's on the end of one of the pump uh, 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 arrangements as well, right? So um, let's see. I always forget to go get this uh, spotlight. Here's the base here. Here's the base here, pretty a welded structure. And there's different different shapes of bases, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, different manufacturers have different types of bases. We're very proud of ours. It's a very sturdy base, a very very. Um, and again, the the design of it follows the HI uh, requirements for designing uh, HVAC hydronic bases. Um, and then there, uh, ours has a drip drain pan. Some do, some don't, or, or whatever. Um, because there, you know, sometimes it, it, you could get a little dripping here. At least it doesn't go on the floor. There's the suction there. You'll notice uh, uh, it's not un uncommon to see a straightening vein here. Uh, centrifugal pumps love water coming in that is uh, laminar, meaning not, no swirling. We don't want any swirling. So any way we can help that situation, we do it. Um, this this component, this uh, 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 piece head here, does not replace um, uh, uh, good design, being a suction diffuser or straight run a pipe, uh, but it does help straighten water coming in. And when I uh, uh, one of the pieces of equipment that uh, gets attached to these pumps quite a bit is a suction diffuser. It's a, a right angle component. Uh, most pump manufacturers offer it, sell it with the. Uh, they, it's called a piece of trim, actually, right? The valving and, and, and suction diffusers. But it had what the suction diffuser does. It, it gets mounted right to the at a 90 degree angle. And actually, you I think you can get them mounted. Well, anyways, most of the time it's right right at a 90 degree angle. So the water, the piping comes straight down. The water can turn and go in, and it goes in laminar. Um, if you don't have a component like that, you need, uh, you know, it depends on who you talk to or whatever, five to 10 pipe diameters of straight pipe going into that pipe, uh, excuse me, going into that pump to, to get the proper flow uh, requirements. Otherwise, you're just going to cause problems from a from a operation standpoint. And um, one of the handouts, or may, uh, at least I'm sure the base mounted handout would have more information on that. I really do suggest um, if you get a chance, especially in these days when a lot of us uh, uh, are afraid to leave our house, I shouldn't say afraid, um, uh, but but anyways, uh, life's a little different for many of us um, working from home or whatnot. Uh, but those I and O manuals, I and I and O manuals that uh, are attached to this in the pump uh, uh, chart startup checklist, uh, those are pretty neat things to to, to take a look at um, in our industry. Uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, us manufacturers, we send them out, and I don't think people necessarily uh, have ever read them. So um, it, it, it has some great information in, in, in there from, 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 from that regard. Here's the discharge, right? Kind of seen it before. The casing or the volute, just so you know some more terminologies. A bearing frame, 
This is uh, not an uncommon piece of uh, uh, equipment for a base mounted pump. It actually has bearings and a shaft in it. So th think about the uh, structure of, uh, of this uh, component. There's an impeller here, impeller inside the casing, as we've seen in the cutaways. That's attached to a shaft that goes into this bearing frame. And the shaft has two ends. One end goes into the impeller. The other end comes out the other end of the bearing frame. And then there's actually a coupler here, and we'll see some pictures of that shortly, um, that attaches this shaft with the shaft for the motor. So this motor, right, here's the terminology motor. I think most of us can see that picture and understand that. That has a shaft on it as well. So there's actually, this is considered a split coupled pump because the sh two shaft, there's two shafts, they're separate, right? So you have a sh an impeller shaft, um, and then you also have a motor shaft. Um, and, and in our industry, um, many of the pumps are split coupled, especially once you start getting into a bigger um, application, motor application, maybe above 10 horse, 15 horse, and we'll talk about that a little further as well. So, and and um, I think we have four or five different size bearing frames based on the size of the uh, of the pump and the horsepower involved. The engineers work hard on the impeller, uh, excuse me, the uh, diameters of the shaft to make sure they're correct and, and stuff like that. Now notice this base has some openings here. Um, um, and uh, this base gets mounted uh, usually on some type of pad or an elevated pad or, or whatnot. It has to be leveled. <laughs> Uh, and, and that in our industry, that's one of the mo most important things that can happen to a pump, a base mounted pump um, at assemblies, uh, excuse me, at installation, is that it to be properly leveled. And again, that all you know, man manual has a, a great uh, a listing of how to do that, right? You shim it, you, you put shims under it, uh, you know, uh, but you have to do that properly. And then once that's done, if you read the INO man manual, you are um, supposed to grout this base okay um, and um, there's all different types of grouting out there I'm sure our manual recommends one type I don't want to uh, override what that says but really what it is it's uh, fill it up with concrete right make it make that base part of the uh, uh, the house base the concrete base so uh, that that's already there and that really uh, quiets everything down really quiets everything down from an installate uh, excuse me from an operation standpoint when things are out of uh, out of whack, um, uh, you could get some noise or, or, or whatnot. So it's very, very important to, to, to follow those INO manuals um, properly. Another uh, reason um, you, you need to le look at those uh, manuals is to learn how to properly align these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, shafts. So the alignment of uh, uh, the shafts through the coupler, uh, coupler has, to, uh, has to be quite uh, exact. I forget the exact tolerances involved, but if those aren't aligned properly, you're going to cause problems uh, during inst uh, during a startup and or operation. Uh, and so the uh, shaft alignment is very, very important on base mounted and suction pumps. I think I kicked this one to death. Uh, let me see. That's about it on this uh, basic picture. Let me go to another one. Come on now. There we go. So here's a, another cutaway uh, or kind of a, an, a, an explosion maybe of some other components, right? Yeah, so before here's we the, get into uh, this next section here, uh, we have some great questions that came up. Yeah. And uh, one uh, that popped up recently, it says, is the cut water part of the impeller or part of the volute? And the answer part of to the, that one, It's a part of the volute. And the distance between the rotating impeller and the cut water, which is part of the volute, is called a cut water gap. So as Brett said, the uh, cut water is actually the volute, but the, the distance between the impeller and the cut water is called a cut water gap. So yep. hopefully that answers your question. Uh, let's see, uh, what is the tolerance of misalignment of the coupler? Um, I happen to know that one, Brett, off the top of my head, and it's five awesome. thousandths of an inch. It turns out if you check our installation and operation manual, you'll see that the alignment between the motor shaft and the pump shaft has to be within five thousandths of an inch in both planes, both vertical and horizontal planes. And, and just to add to that comment uh, from a uh, alignment standpoint, at our facility, we rough align them. So they are in alignment um, at our facility. 
but think about what happens to these uh, uh, units. Uh, they are shipped over, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're moved around with fork trucks, forklifts, whatever. They're put into trucks. Uh, they're shipped uh, over the, the roadways. Um, uh, maybe maybe uh, where you guys live, it's nice and smooth, but out here in New England, some of the roads are a little bumpy. So things move around. So uh, be, when they get to the job site, they should be rough aligned again. And then uh, hopefully the installation of the piping is correct and you're taking the loads off and you're piping away and, and all of that. And that's another whole presentation, uh, but they need to be final aligned. I, I, I mean, these things should be aligned uh, three, four, five times. Um, and that uh, really uh, speaks to that tolerance that Rich just mentioned. Sorry about that, Rich, go ahead. The other thing that is a, a bit of a subtle piece of information, the pump itself is bolted directly to the, the drain pan, and there are no shims underneath the pump between the pump and the drain pan. What gets shimmed is the actual electric motor where it mounts to the base. So when we do the pre-alignment from the factory, we include the shims that would bring it back into alignment. And what Brett was getting at is when you travel over the road with the, you know, the trucks are delivering this stuff, you can actually wind up having uh, a misalignment, but uh, you should have the proper number of shims in the right location and you have to just move things around a little bit to get them back in alignment. Oh, here's a great question, Brett. Yep. Are sp spring isolators required on base mounted pumps? And uh, actually, that's something that the design professional decides whether or not they want spring isolators between the uh, pump. But generally speaking, the isolators do not go between the pump base and the concrete housekeeping pad. The pump is generally mounted on top of an inertia base and rigidly mounted to the inertia base and the pump uh, base is grouted. And then the inertia pad is uh, isolated from the housekeeping pad with springs. So in general, the pump base does not mount on springs. One thing I'd like to add, and I forgot to mention this last week, most pump manufacturers actually um, have designed bases and um, spacers underneath their motors. What I mean by that is um, uh, you have uh, mo motor frames come in different sizes, okay? Uh, different uh, frame sizes, 145, 143, 150, uh, whatever the numbers are. So it's not unusual for a pump wet end, this is, I call this the wet end, the casing pollute, to uh, this combination, this base, to have six different motors that could fit on here. So as Rich was mentioning, uh, one of the motors would mount right on uh, right on the base itself, and then you would start shimming as the motors become different dimensions uh, to fit other ones up there or or put spacers on them. So uh, that's something that um, uh, is uh, you, you you'd be you you would start seeing that uh, depends on which uh, base uh, pump combination you would order, what model you would order. So another question just popped up. It said, uh, "Does your base require concrete in it?" And uh, the bottom line is that we recommend that all bases for base mounted pumps have grout. Uh, so if they're properly grouted, um, that's our recommendation. It's in our installation and operation manual. Take it away, Brett. So here's a, a, a picture of kind of a blow up of uh, some other components, a little more detail on these bare, uh, base <coughs> mounted I like to spend a lot of time on this uh, the the base mounted pumps because in 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 the United States anyways it's still probably the most common pipe. Um, in other parts of the world, like right above the our border in Canada, uh, you're going to see some verticals. But anyways, that's why I'm spending a little more time on the base mounted. So here's that coupler I was talking about, Woods Duraflex coupler. Uh, Takeo and many others have standardized on this type of coupler. It, very, very uh, sturdy, and it works great with variable speed um, applications. And in this day and age, uh, most applications are variable speed. There's a nice uh, break. I always forget to get this. Uh, the, the pump shaft here, right? And that shaft goes all the way through. Uh, someone mentioned the uh, mechanical seal. Um, uh, and uh, really, uh, to be quite honest, uh, like Rich said, there's no maintenance. Uh, besides getting clean stuff in there, you can't maintain a mechanical seal. You start touching that seal, 
um, uh, you're, 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 bad things are going to happen. The oil from your fingers could could ruin it, let alone any fine piece of dust or, or dust or grit or whatnot. Here's the impeller. Uh, you know, you can kind of see the vein and, and how it kind of um, uh, uh, turns or goes back into the uh, hub of the uh, hub of it. Here's a bearing frame assembly, uh, pretty common for base-mounted pumps. Uh, so the, the, this shaft goes all the way through. There's bearings in here. Uh, the Taco uh, FI model uh, standard one does not. The bearings do not require lubrication. And again, read the INO manual. Um, some of our older models did require lubrication. You can actually still buy a bearing frame that requires lubrication, but uh, um, I, I don't think you should, but that's another whole discussion. Uh, um, anyways, and then we have a, a Freshita seal here that prevents dust from getting into this cavity right here. Uh, so keep that in mind. And there's the motor and the motor shaft. And there's all different types of uh, bear, uh, pump motor manufacturers out there in, in that regard. So this is the Woods Duraflex coupler, pretty, pretty common. Uh, in our industry. Here's the old style. So if, if you're out on projects and you go into a mechanical room, you may see a, um, oh no, this is a cut, I'm sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. This is a kind of a, a break, a cut, cut away. It's like a rubber type of piece. This is the Woods Duraflex coupler. Um, uh, here's the old style, um, Woods Sureflex coupler. Um, and this was uh, used for many, many years uh, in the industry but it had this uh, kind of sawtooth type of arrangement uh, in here. And uh, for variable speed applications, uh, it, it really uh, started to wear. And you would see that uh, the material uh, on, the base of the, uh, on the base itself. Uh, so, but, but I just like to point these out just so that you're familiar with these, because if you do go into a mechanical room, um, you may see a coupler like this. And uh, who knows if you see some, uh, if someone has an issue, you can say, well, you know, the, the, we need to replace that coupler or, or get a different type of uh, pump. Uh, uh, new. They have modern stuff now that uh, works better for variable speed. So there's all kinds of stuff to learn. So I uh, just like to point out some of the older things that maybe uh, you might see out there as well. And again, most popular design and suction pumps, sucks and discharge at 90 degrees, right? I think we, you know, I, I beat this down just so you can understand it. Base mounted, split coupled. Uh, what that means is the uh, seal can be uh, worked on or the pump can be worked on the wet end without moving the motor, okay? So you, you, you gotta take the coupler off and obviously the coupler guard and, and other components, but you don't have to move the motor. A foot mounted, close coupled pump, um, and the difference is, the motor shaft is the impeller shaft. So you're gonna see other arrangements of pumps, uh, vertical and horizontal and whatnot, um, but the uh, you got closed coupled and split coupled. The one on the left is a split coupled, the one on the right is a closed coupled, our little base mounted. And most folks um, offer both. And it, uh, in our case, the one on the right is a CI um, one, and the one on the left is a um, uh, FI. If you ordered, I'm going to make up some numbers here, uh, CI3007. If you ordered an FI3007, the uh, output would be the same, the flow and head. So the, the, compo the casing components are the same. And in the impeller, it's the other components um, outside of the pump that are different. That's not uncommon uh, in that regard. So keep that in mind. Here's some other uh, centrifugal inline pumps. Uh, these are what we call vertical pumps. Uh, any of our folks uh, on this uh, webinar from north of the border, uh, uh, can uh, up in Canada, um, the can Canadian market is probably 80 to 90 percent vertical pumps. Um, uh, they uh, use them uh, for most of their commercial work. These are inline, horizontal inline um, uh, little guys here. They probably go up to two, 250 GPM. And again, uh, a direct coupled, closed coupled, and a split coupled over here. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, both are designed not to be, have the motor supported. The components themselves are designed so they don't need motor support. If you go into a mechanical room and you see some type of hook or support around this end, because it just, it just looks like it needs support, um, uh, <laughs> either loosen it or cut it or whatever, or talk to somebody because if you put a little force on that, you're gonna get this out of alignment, you're gonna cause problems. So just keep that in mind. Um, I have seen that before. Um, 
and I won't tell you some of the things I've done, like loosen nuts just to let the string. Uh, anyways, <laughs> I, I, I digress too much. These are our inline vertical pumps. Here's a, a direct coupled again, closed coupled. KV happens to be our model number. There's other model uh, uh, designations out there. And this is our split coupled KS pump. Um, one of the nice things about these guys over here is the alignment issue that can be an issue. And, and uh, most times when a, a manufacturer's rep or a, uh, a manufacturer get a call about an alignment issue on a base mounted pump, it's not a five or 10 or 15 horse motor. It's a 60, 75, or 100 horse motor, right? So the uh, obviously the the problems multiply quite quite uh, highly. Um, so um, uh, that's one reason that we're seeing folks take a look at going to these guys here, um, uh, and um, and maybe they take up less room. It all depends on uh, the piping arrangements and whatnot. They, 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 some people think they take up le less room. I, I tend to agree, but not everyone does. But anyways, um, uh, just keep that in mind. I would recommend um, only offering the uh, direct coupled or closed coupled pump. See, there's another terminology that means the same almost, um, or it does, it, uh, up to maybe 10 horse, uh, just from a maintenance standpoint. I always like to think about uh, any pump I would specify in its life, right? The whole life of the pump. And sooner or later, someone's gonna have to maintain that pump. And um, Although pump manufacturers offer these pump motor combinations up to 60 horse, because it's a JM style motor, uh, we all offer them up to 60 horse. Uh, you're really, in my opinion, doing a disservice to the folks that need to work on this. If it gets too, if this motor gets too heavy and they got to lift it up, um, obviously a person, uh, one per, uh, you can't lift it without a mechanical piece of equipment, a chain fall or, or, or some type of uh, something, overhead chain or whatever. These guys over here, you can actually, without moving that motor, you can access the seal. We actually have some videos on our website that show you how you can do that. Um, and it's really teacher friendly, to be quite honest. But you undo the, uh, the, the bolting of this stainless uh, uh, aluminum uh, coupler and you have access to, to, to the cover and you can uh, and access it very, very easily. So uh, another reason maybe to consider um, these type of pumps. So they're very, very common in our industry now um, as well. Hey, Brett. Yes, sir. We've got a couple of uh, comments and some good questions. So awesome. uh, one, one comment came in from uh, Ryan Graham, and Ryan says, uh, you do need to move the motor uh, to remove the rotating assembly on the FI. There isn't enough room between the shaft to leave the motor in place. And, uh, Depends what kind Ryan, of coupler. Do you have a spacer coupler? Well, anyways, yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what I was going to say was, uh, uh, Ryan, um, if you could just type in on the question and answer section, if uh, if that's your experience with all of the FIs, or is it just uh, a, a few of the FIs? Because I know in some cases the motor has to be kind of moved to the side, but you don't have to physically pick it up. And I think in other cases it does clear the motor. So it'd be interesting to see from. Uh, Ryan's perspective, if it has to be done all the time. Good point. Uh, let's see. We have uh, another question. Uh, someone asked about what is the Duraflex, uh, Woods Duraflex coupling made out of? And uh, so one thing uh, that I would suggest is, I actually did this while Brett was chatting, uh, is that if you go to the Woods Duraflex website, they have a terrific uh, a uh, piece of literature in there that tells you exactly what the Woods Duraflex coupler is made out of and uh, all of the uh, specific information. Um, I'm not sure if, if we have that that detailed uh, information on our website, but they certainly have it on the Woods Duraflex website. So that's a great source of information for guys that need that information. Um, okay, uh, let's see, there's another one that popped up. Uh, does uh, let me just see what it says here. Oh, does a vertical inline pump need a suction diffuser? That's a great question. I'll let you handle that one, Brett. Um, yes, or straight runs a pipe in it. Uh, it the laminar flow requirement, or or uh, yeah, the that type of flow um, requirement is um, uh, necessary for uh, vertical um, uh, pumps as well. <clears throat> So I would recommend putting a suction diffuser on. And one thing that's nice, if you put a suction diffuser right on here, 
on the uh, suction side and on the discharge side um, uh, you can go 90 degrees straight up so your piping gets kind of tight there so that's something to consider a right angle type of valve or, or whatnot or a tight elbow long radius elbow or something like that but yes the answer is yes <laughs> we actually I, I have uh, several pumps in our mechanical room that are vertical inlines and we have in suction diffuses connected to them because we have vertical pipe coming down and uh, the in suction diffuses with the vertical inlines works really well another another oh, basic got a comment by by ryan let's see with the standard duraflex the motor needs to be moved to the side a little not completely removed and then he says i have installed spacer couplings uh, but they are not common those are great comments and great information, Ryan, so keep it coming. Go ahead, Brett, take it away. One, one of the things, uh, uh, these type of inline pumps, uh, the, the flange sizes are the same diameter. On a base-mounted pump, uh, normally the inlet size is one diameter larger than the outlet size. Here's, go ahead, Rich, were you going to add to that? No? Okay. No, that wasn't me. That was somebody All else. Right. All right. Um, and then uh, here's some uh, uh, kind of war horses in our industry, split, ca split case pumps. They allow access to the impeller seal without moving motor, disturbing piping. You can see there's a, it's kind of a little hard to see here, but there's a lot of uh, hardware here you need to disassemble. But this, it splits, all right? It, it splits in the, and this whole piece comes out and you get access to the uh, impellers. Uh, I think in the old days, these were probably more prevalent for bigger systems, but we see them, uh, we sell them on a regular basis or uh, manufacture them on a regular basis. And you have the horizontal type here, and you also have vertical split case, and then you can get them with different uh, arrangements. So it's right angle or, or split going straight up. So, um, and I'm gonna show you some, um, uh, I won't get into applications because really there's, it's, it's kind of a crossover for applications. We'll talk about that in a chart uh, very shortly. Uh, about that for which one for which application that's a common question rich and i encounter uh in that regard we also um offer through our facility and um uh, just uh, in nashville tennessee uh, our uh, vertical turbine line taco turbines uh, we do offer turbine pumps as well for the hvac industry as well as for mining and, and um, farming uh, probably more prevalent, but uh, in HVAC, maybe in a condenser type uh, setup or, or well pump or whatever. Um, so we do have for the, some of those. And we're going to be coming out with some uh, great webinars or, or classes on these uh, uh, guys as well. They're not that common uh, for HVAC industry, but nonetheless, uh, they are um, out there and available through Taco. Here's kind of a capacity arrangement uh, a, a, a table. Uh, for, for them. And, and again, one of the questions Rich and I get uh, uh, periodically or quite often when, we, when we're in front of groups is which one is for which application? And uh, <laughs> uh, Rich, uh, Rich has been on the design side uh, as a design engineer for many, many, many years, uh, three or four uh, decades as well. <laughs> Anyways, and he, one Did of his answers. You have to say many, 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 many. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're younger than me, so come That's on right. now. I'm uh, for those of you that know Brett and I, I'm 10 years younger than Brett. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> See, I've, uh, I've got him so confused now. He, he, I know. He doesn't Where know was I? Where was I? Oh, Where there, there I? we go. One of Rich's uh, common answers is it really, uh, it, it's, it's, it's mostly the per what the person is used to or is comfortable with. So as you can see here, there's a lot of crossover between some of the uh, flow rates and heads and whatnot. Obviously, the little horizontal inlines, uh, many, many school systems that might have something like that or some hotels, smaller hotels, uh, they, they don't maybe cross over the end suction vertical and split case, uh, but some of the other ones do. And, and, and you know, we, we, obviously, we all go up to pretty high volumes there in horsepowers, uh, but, you know, 60 to 70, 80 percent of the business is more in that, uh, you know, uh, 100 to 1,000 or 2,000 horse uh, GPM range, and uh, any one of them can do it. And it's personal preference, personal preference, to be quite honest. They all will work. They all will work. They all have the little pluses and minuses, but they all work. Uh, like I said, the, the folks up in Canada, for the most part, um, uh, uh, use K as uh, use the vertical inline pumps. Uh, uh, almost uh, not. A, I, you can never say exclusively, but quite a few 
of their applications uh, are, are the vertical inline pumps. In the States, um, the end suctions are very, very common and popular, um, and they, they go out on a daily basis for, from Takeo uh, and other pump manufacturers uh, in, in North America as well. But, uh, and it's a bigger, it still continues to be a bigger uh, mix out, out of our facility, but uh, probably the, ver the verticals are still a growing line uh, in that regard. The split case, uh, there's some folks that are very, very um, uh, um, uh, prevalent, uh, or they like to specify those, although they, they probably aren't that big big of a market uh, from a, a share from, from a TACO's perspective. And then the vertical turbines are very, very uh, specialized and what applications they would be for. Uh, so for most applications, you wouldn't even suggest uh, for, for a vertical turbine. Here's one of the uh, few things I wanna make sure we cover is the centrifugal pump affinity laws. Um, uh, and, and it's really, uh, it, it's a relationship rating between flow, head, horsepower, RPM, and impeller diameter. So they're all interrelated, they're all interrelated. And on the left-hand side, um, uh, as you change speed, as the RPM changes, right? RPM is speed, right? You can get, you can calculate different, uh, your new flows, right? Here's Q1 and then you get Q2. It's um, uh, the power of one. Your uh, head is the power of two, is squared. Your horsepower is the power of three based on the speed change, it's cubed. So there's some big changes there, but uh, you know, some of the curves and charts that we send out utilize this information so any one of us could actually sit down and look at some of the impeller curves and start calculating and some of the requirements or, or or whatnot and get some different values as you change diameter as you change diameter right d2 d1 you have the same relationships here so um, uh, flow is uh, uh, to the power of one uh, head is squared and horsepower is cubed so Really, that's, uh, you know, I do like to point these out. Uh, they are uh, affinity laws. There's much more information if you Google it um, or start looking at it. But um, we use it, our pump manufacturers use it on a regular basis. It's all built into our computer system to calculate uh, impeller nuts uh, for flow and head and stuff like that. So when we talk a pump curve, I'm going to kind of finish up with these in pump cu curves. Pumps can only operate on its curve. Right, this is a very simple kind of arrangement here. Rich, uh, I, I believe we already had our webinar on pump uh, in curves. We talked about it for, for over an hour, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it today. But um, uh, this is a very simple type of setup for impeller cur for curves here, for pump curves, and they can only operate on their curves. So it's not unusual for a pump manufacturer to show you different impellers, diameters, right? We talked about impeller trimming or cutting or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, different diameters here. So we show you different impeller diameters. And then, the, so these are the impeller curves, but that pump can only operate it uh, on its impeller curve. And it's not uncommon to show the flow and head uh, on it as well. And down below would be the flow or NPM. That's pretty common in our, in our industry. And on the left-hand side would be head and feet. Uh, very, very common. Um, obviously, there, there's curves or, or numbers for most manufacturers also show the metric uh, units as well on their pump curves. Um, I just didn't show it in this one here. System curve is an actual calculated value. Um, uh, it, it's the right half of a parabola, um, and it's the relationship. Uh, it's part, it, it, it comes from the affinity laws, but it's relationship be, between flow and head uh, squared. And it's really a, a, a calculated value, and it's an important uh, a curve from an operation standpoint, uh, speeding up and slowing down. Uh, the pump uh, pump has to operate where it intersects on the, uh, uh, where the impeller curve intersects the um, uh, uh, parabola curve, the uh, system curve. Um, so uh, it, when you took your, when you were with your friends in, uh, in grammar school or high school doing geometry, or no, maybe it was algebra, and they said, when am I ever gonna use this uh, formula, formula like this? If you do a curve or a computer does it, there's a reason right there. So just keep that in mind. Then you also show some horsepower curves um, as well. Um, uh, and uh, there's your impeller curves. There's your horsepower curves, 5, 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 20. Uh, there's your operating point. I'm just going over some basic information on curves 
and, and uh, if you want more information on curves, um, uh, the webinar is available through our website, uh, takeocomfort.com. Uh, so uh, uh, keep that in mind as well. And here's kind of a big breakdown of, of the curves as well. I'm getting near the end, Rich. Uh, do we have any more questions before I finish up? Yeah, we got some uh, really great questions. So awesome. uh, uh, Todd Daniels asked, do suction diffusers introduce a significant additional pressure drop? And uh, the, the best way I can answer that is that if you ever look at one of our uh, pressure drop charts for suction diffusers, you can see that you can actually select uh, such, suction diffusers to have um, a, a full range of pressure drops. I personally, uh, when I select a suction diffuser, I like to have selected the suction diffuser at less than five feet. Now the chart goes up higher than that, but it's incumbent upon the, you know, the the design professional community to select the suction diffuser that has a relatively low pressure drop. So, so it, it's kind of a double-sided sword. You know, you could pick a suction diffuser that has a much higher pressure drop, but I would recommend that you select one that has a lower pressure drop. I I, I would like to add. I would like to add that you. Should be able to find one that has a reasonable number and it's not expensive. You faded out there, Brett. I think I lost you there for a second. I'm back. Go ahead with the next back. question then. Okay, so on the next, yeah, we've got another great question here. What are the requirements of straight run of pipe installation and suction and discharge side of the pumps? So, um, you know, in the in the pump world, we would love to have as many pipe diameters as possible. When we actually test the pump for performance criteria in accordance with the Hydraulic Institute standards, I believe we test the pump with 15 pipe diameters at the inlet and 10 pipe diameters at the outlet. Now that's not all that practical in the, uh, in the field. Um, so on the suction side of the pump, uh, we like to see a reasonable amount of uh, pipe diameters if you're not using a suction diffuser because a suction diffuser is specifically designed to change the direction of flow and minimize the amount of turbulence, as Brett pointed out earlier. Uh, but if you don't have a suction diffuser, you want to try to get at a minimum of 10 pipe diameters and a long radius elbow before you enter the uh, suction side of the pump. And on the discharge side, the pipe diameters have less of an influence over the characteristics of the pump per se, but have a greater uh, uh, influence on the pressure drop of the system. And what I mean by that is that if you have an elbow, for example, connected directly to the discharge side of the pump, it will have some influence over the performance of the pump, but it'll create an, an unusually high pressure drop because the uh, the water when it discharges on the side of the pump is quite turbulent. And so it's nice to have um, some pipe diameters at the discharge side to minimize the pressure drop in the system as opposed to affecting the characteristics of the pump. All right, and there's another question here. I'm gonna let Brett answer this one because I think he already touched on it earlier. When you have zero PSI at pump inlet that is located on a rooftop mechanical room, would that make you think the circuit is low on fluid? Should the suction ever be at zero PSI? Brett, take it away. Wait, so, I'm, I'm talking, you, was the question about having the pump on top and zero PSI? I, I didn't quite understand the question, I'm sorry. Yeah, so it, the question specifically is when you have a zero PSI uh, at the pump inlet and the pump happens to be located at the highest part of the building, um, would that indicate that the uh, system is low on fluid and should the suction ever be at zero PSI? The suction should never be at zero PSI. Yeah, in general, what you want is to make sure that you have, especially at the top of the building, that you have some positive pressure. Because if you didn't have positive pressure at the top of the building, you'd have no way of forcing air out of the system. And you would typically have at the top of the building, you'd have a piping system and you'd have a uh, either manual vents or automatic air vents. 
And without having positive pressure, there's no way you could get the air out of the system. So in general, we do not like to see zero PSI at the inlet of the pump. There are occasions when it does happen, and there might be a good reason for it, but in general, we try to avoid that if at all possible. Okay, uh, let's see. We've got, uh, uh, let's see. We got one. Oh, here's a great one. How do you balance a hot water recirculating pump in a system where the temperature actuated automatic balance valves are used throughout the system? That's a great question. Um, how, to how to balance, how to balance the a hot water recirculating pump in a system where the temperature actuated automatic balance valves are used throughout the system? And the question was posed by Marion Wright. Can I see that? Yeah, looks like Marion Wright. And I believe you're asking this with regard to, is that a domestic hot water system and the recirc is part of the domestic hot water recirc system? If Marion could just type in, say, yeah, that's really where I'm headed. Well, in a minute, let's see if she comes back and, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's a he or she. I'm gonna uh, plead the fifth on that. Okay. Oh, yes. Marion said that it is a, a domestic hot water system. And so in general, whenever they are used these, uh, uh, I think one of the manufacturers is, uh, uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's called SureFlow. I forget the name of the manufacturer, but anyway, uh, they use these thermostatically controlled uh, valves that open and close based on temperature. And in that type of situation, uh, it, the pump is, is behaving as if it were a two-way valve system, similar to what you would use in a conventional uh, heating system. So um, the best way to think of it is that the when the uh, the, the valves are usually uh, can be purchased from the manufacturer with a certain preset temperature, and when the water temperature drops below that preset value, let's assume for a moment that I'm just making up a number let's say it was 120 degrees, when the water temperature drops below that 120, the valve uh, opens fully. And so for balancing purposes, you'd wanna make sure that the water is relatively cold, forcing all the valves to open, and then you would balance the uh, pump in accordance with the valves being open. Okay, so we do have some other questions in there, Brett, but I think what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we will be collecting all of these questions and then over the next few days, we'll be providing answers so that uh, whether we answered your question live or not, we'll, we'll be answering the questions in writing. I think uh, at this point, we're going to wrap things up. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> we're gonna be wrapping some things up. So uh, Brett, do you wanna say uh, a few last words yeah. before we yeah. move on? Uh, great questions today. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully uh, we, we covered it. We do apologize, as Rich mentioned at the beginning, for our uh, break in the internet, uh, sort per se, uh, last Tuesday, but we appreciate you sitting in for Takeo Tuesday webinar today, and there's uh, another one next Tuesday, so go to our um, website and check it out, but thank you for everyone's attention, and uh, signing off from, I'm in Massachusetts. Uh, Rich, take it away. Goodbye, my friend. Thanks, Brett, and I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that tuned in today. I think we broke another record because we did this presentation uh, last week, and we were limited to 500, and today we had over 360, so between both presentations, we had over 860 people participate. That was a great turnout, so thank you very, very much. We really appreciate you taking the time and listening to these different webinars that we're producing. So uh, I'd like to sign off now and say uh, thanks again for everything and uh, have a great uh, rest of the week and please be safe out there in these challenging times. Good night, everyone. And from Takeo, be safe.